All right, here we go. Awesome. Hey, Justin. Yeah. Real quick before we get started, I, I keep forgetting to do this, but um, hold on. First off, hey everybody, Oscar here, uh, Director of Recruitment. First off, just want to say welcome to any new members, anybody anybody who's newly on the call today. Uh, I don't think I see any new names, but I could be wrong. Um, welcome to WMA. Uh, we have a great presentation today with TCF Bank. Um, in the chat, I've dropped the Instagram. We have dropped the LinkedIn. We want to get to know the newest people here. Um, at the end, we'll ask you to, you know, turn on your camera or uh, and unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Um, but definitely tap in with us on LinkedIn. Tap in with us on Instagram. Um, we're always posting engaging content, so uh, definitely do that. And um, yeah, Justin, I'll let you take it from there. Awesome. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, that's great. Sweet, sweet. All right. Well, I'm just going to jump right into the announcements here, guys. So first one, we have a FPA of Michigan virtual happy hour that's upcoming this week. So Financial Planning Association of Michigan. Uh, we're all very familiar, I'm sure. But yeah, for any new faces, this is a group of advisors, financial advisors here in the state of Michigan, who usually invite all of us great college students into their events. So this happy hour is something they do once a month. Um, I see a lot of people here on this call have been there. So the next one is this Thursday, 6 to 8 p.m. Colin Overwig, former, you know, Spartan uh, is running it. So we hope to see you guys all there. If you are interested in that, we um, I've put up all the events that FPA offers to us students on our events page. So if you go to our website, msuwma.com, look on the events page, you'll see all the information for this event and all the other great FPA events that we're invited to. And um, as always, FPA events, they, it does look like you have to register. So you do have to register events, but if you mark that you're a student, there is no cost. So for full-time advisors, there is a cost to these events, but as a student, you don't have to pay. So next big one here, and really the only other one I have tonight is that eBoard and Spartan Journal applications for next year. So the fall of 2021, um, they are gonna be opening next Tuesday. So I can't believe it's that time of year again, but it is, it's March. Um, we've got a lot of great seniors who are graduating this year. A lot of awesome Spartan Journal guys um, who've been on the team this year. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunities. Um, we're gonna have more details and we'll go over those at our meeting next week. But keep an eye out for those. There's going to be a separate application for both. Um, so you guys will be able to differentiate. But um, in the meantime, what I want to say is if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or the incoming president, who is Vincent Pachalo, or vice president, Jake Hiranima. So if you guys have any questions, please reach out to any of those, those fine gentlemen. So with that, actually, I'm going to pass it back over to you, Oscar and Alex, who I believe are going to announce our check winner. Yes, sir. So uh, very excited about this. Um, this is kind of like a new idea we wanted to do. For those who haven't heard of it, we're giving away uh, a check subscription today. I will be emailing the, uh, the login for that information, for that account to our winner. Um, but yeah, this is just a way we try to create engagement for the group. So today's winner is, let's see if he's on the call. Yes, he is. Mitch Duffy. Congratulations, my guy. Thank you. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being a part of the group, man. We'll, uh, uh, drop your email in the chat and I will send you the information for the login. Awesome. Thank you, Oscar. Congrats, Mitch. It's a great thing. Great track giveaway. I think we're the only club that's ever done anything like that. So kudos to you, Oscar. Great idea. So before I kick it over to you, Varun, I do want to just mention one thing. So we're going to start doing an editorial spotlight every week. So we, um, we've plugged this a couple of times, but I want to mention this again. The Spartan Journal has an editorial section where you guys, members, can submit stories. 
Now, this is this is a great resume builder to say the least. I'm writing these quick 200, 250 word stories. Um, not only are they a great resume builder that you can share on LinkedIn, but they are something that helps you with your communication skills. It helps you read, it helps you um, write, and that helps you be a better advisor. So every week we're going to do an editorial spotlight, which goes on the Spartan Journal with all our other amazing writers, which we see here up on the screen. So this week we had Vincent, um, last week we had Costa, and we're going to have some great writers again next week. So just want to plug the editorial again, if you guys are interested in writing a story, we have those links available on our website and any questions, feel free to reach out to myself. So, so with that, Varun, I will kick it over to you with our first story. All right. Thank you, Justin. So um, for this week, I wrote about the Senate passing Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. Uh, the bill's been up in question for about two months, but just this weekend, it was finally passed by the Senate and hoping to be passed by the House relatively soon. Uh, Biden is looking to have that bill signed on his desk by March 14th before unemployment benefits uh, run out. Uh, that bill is pretty inclusive, covering things from the $1,400 stimulus payments to airline, U.S. airline payroll support, um, with that being a sector that was particularly hit hard with by COVID. Uh, the bill did not come without incident. There was a lot of Republican opposition stating that the bill was a wasteful list of Democrat priorities. Uh, yet through all that, Biden continued to emphasize the support for that bill, stating that we cannot afford to take one step forward and then two steps back, and also stating that if the people need another bill, another one will be made. Uh, now I'll pass it over to Andrew. Thanks. So throughout the course of the power grid issues in Texas, many Texans were overcharged for power. An independent monitor had concluded that Texas kept their energy prices inflated for probably days longer than needed. And this period alone was estimated to have caused over $16 billion worth of extra charges to customers in Texas. So the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, he created a panel and that panel told the grid operator to raise the peak price of a megawatt hour to $9,000. And normally it's, it used to be $12 is probably the average. So it's a pretty high increase. And these prices continued throughout the end of the state of emergency rather than the end of the blackout periods. So last week, criticism led to the commission chair resigning. And on Friday, the two remaining commissioners, they made it clear they weren't really interested in repricing the previous megawatt hours, which again, were closer to $22. And many people believe that these enhanced prices were in effect for four days too long. Corporations and Texans who are involved in the, en in the energy field took the biggest burden of these costs. Uh, this company, Vistra Corp, they operate in Texas as a power generator and retailer. They estimated losses over a billion dollars alone. And then a lot of wind farm operators are also in financial trouble because a lot of them are required to continue purchasing energy even at these inflated costs due to the details of their contracts. So while the commission related to energy didn't necessarily strike down the monitor's idea regarding repricing, they didn't necessarily show their support either. So that's all I've got. I'll pass it to Nick. <clears throat> Thank you. So this week I wrote about how Amazon is pretty close to a deal with the NFL. Uh, so most of us are pretty familiar with watching the NFL on traditional television networks like Fox, NBC, or ABC, but things are starting to change with NFL signing deals with streaming services such as like Hulu and Amazon. Uh, so Amazon wants uh, exclusive streaming rights uh, of NFL Thursday night games until 2023, but the NFL is asking up to a billion dollars per season for this potential deal. Uh, and some anonymous workers from Amazon actually mentioned that Amazon is not willing to pay anywhere near $1 billion for the full package, but they are open to a smaller package instead. Um, and this deal would eliminate the availability of watching NFL games on traditional television, except for those local television channels with their team playing. Uh, so regardless of how Amazon works out with this deal, the future of live sports uh, is going to be significantly different with streaming services popping up here and there. So with that, I'll pass it over to our friends at TCF Bank. Sounds great. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Henderson. Um, I am here along with my leader, Garrett Jackson and Jeff Fertuba. 
Um, and we uh, will start with just some short introductions and then I'll give a bit of an overview of TCF and then I'll pass it to, uh, to Jeff and he'll um, take us way into the world of wealth management. So uh, first, like I said, my name's Elizabeth. Um, I'm an associate talent acquisition partner at TCF. I'm also the only person on this call who is not a student or alumni of MSU. Um, so I am in my last semester at Grand Valley uh, and will join the team full-time after I graduate. So Garrett, over to you. Good evening. Um, you, some of you may remember me from last semester when I spoke with you guys, um, but I'll reintroduce myself. My name is Garrett Jackson. Um, I lead university relations for TCF Bank, the primary aspects of my role being um, running our internship program and leading our early career hiring efforts. As Beth alluded to, I am a graduate of Michigan State University, class of 2010. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad we could, you know, get Jeff back on this call so he can speak with you guys. I, I like to think that you guys, um, you know, enjoyed um, listening to myself and Beth speak in the fall, but I know Jeff would probably be of more interest to you and hopefully you enjoy what he has to say to you tonight. All right, Elizabeth, is it me or is it you right now? Yeah, do you want to introduce yourself quickly and then I'll then I'll give us an overview of TCF. Sorry, there's a roundabout here. Uh, very, very good. Yeah. So uh, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for the time here this evening. I'm really looking forward to having a conversation and I hope you have a ton of questions for me. No questions are off limit. Uh, that'll be the most valuable portion of this particular presentation. So with that, Elizabeth, uh, I, I will uh, save the rest of my uh, comments uh, after you uh, go through yours. Sounds great. So um, I'm hoping that most of you are familiar with the, the name TCF Bank, but I just wanted to give a quick overview. If not, um, you might be more familiar with the name Chemical Bank. Um, in 2019, Chemical Bank and TCF Bank merged, um, moving our headquarters to Detroit, Michigan. Um, most of our business is in consumer and small business lending, but also in uh, middle market and corporate banking as well. Um, sorry, I said lending, I meant banking. Um, and so you may have also heard at this point that we are planning on merging into Huntington Bank. Uh, so that merger will be completed throughout the summer. And at that point, we'll be the 11th largest bank in the nation with a dual headquarters in a new tower that we're building right across from Comerica Park in Detroit um, and Columbus, Ohio, where Huntington Bank is currently based. So it's a really exciting time of growth here at the bank. Um, I know everyone on the inside is, is pretty excited. And it's also leading some awesome opportunities for um, you know, the development of our internship and early career positions in the future. Um, so that is a little bit about us. And I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen here for Jeff and he can kind of dive. All right, very good. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'll get to this slide uh, here in a few moments. But again, uh, good evening, uh, MSU Wealth Management Association. My name is Jeff Botruba. I'm a senior vice president uh, and the director of the investment services program uh, for TCF Bank. Again, really a pleasure to be with you. Uh, fellow Spartan, class of 1989. So when I hear 2010, uh, Garrett, it just makes me uh, feel even older uh, than I actually am here today. Um, so with that, I, I just wanna go over the agenda first, uh, give you a little bit of my background, uh, my career, um, as well as talk a little bit more about TCF Wealth Management. As Elizabeth mentioned, we are in the process of an integration right now with uh, Huntington Bank, which is very positive. Uh, for both institutions as we continue to move forward. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about career path options in the wealth management business. And then I'll really open it up for all the questions that you have. So I do wanna save uh, quite a bit of time uh, at the end and we can fill it in any way, shape or form or pivot in any way, shape or form uh, you like as we go through this. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, uh, I am a graduate of Michigan State University, class of 1989. I currently have a daughter at Michigan State. She is a junior, uh, speech pathology, uh, college of communication. I also have a son who is a uh, senior this year in high school. And uh, he is in his uh, final decision process right now. And Michigan State is in the top two for him. So we're keeping our fingers crossed here uh, uh, that he will also be a, a, a fellow Spartan. Uh, my memories of Michigan State are, um, still very vivid in many different ways, very positive. Uh, Crunchies is still one of my favorite places along with uh, LS and the peanut barrel. Uh, Harper's uh, when I was there was called uh, Dooley's and Sensations, little known fact. Uh, if you are a classic rock fan, 
uh, and you follow the band U2, they did play there uh, back in the 80s. Uh, in fact, I think they do credit a lot of their start uh, in the Americas uh, uh, to the owners of Dooley's at that point in time. Uh, Dublin's was a post office and uh, Tom Izzo was an assistant under Judd Heathcote. So those are my Michigan State memories. I still am attached to uh, the university based on um, based on uh, my daughter, uh, happened to uh, marry a Wolverine, uh, but she grew up in East Lansing and she did her MBA at Michigan State. So the ties are uh, certainly there. And uh, again, if there's anything that you need uh, of me and uh, with me uh, after this presentation, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out. I, I've noticed my phone is uh, buzzing. A number of people are uh, connecting with, uh, with me on LinkedIn. Uh, so with that being said, and in, in preparing for this presentation, I did spend a little bit of time just kind of looking through a uh, timeline um, back when I was just getting started in the business, uh, as well as uh, throughout my career. And uh, while I was at Michigan State University, uh, I, I started an internship with a firm called Smith Barney uh, way back in uh, the fall of 1987. And if anybody can remember that time period, uh, back in history as you study, because I don't think any of you were born back then. In fact, I'm fairly certain that you weren't. Uh, that was a crash, uh, the big crash uh, of 1987. Well, that's when I started and I promptly lost my internship uh, shortly after that crash. Uh, so it was a really great way uh, to enter uh, the field in 1989 uh, coming off of this, uh, this major event. Uh, but there's been so many events, uh, you know, in my 30 plus years uh, in the business right now. I think back to 1999 when the Dow Jones uh, hit 10,000, and today it's you know well over 31,000. Uh, shortly uh, following uh, hitting 10,000, we went into uh, a tech bubble correction uh, at that point in time. Certainly, I, I have very vivid memories of what happened in September 11th of 2001. At that time period, I was working for Morgan Stanley, and I did have uh, a number of my uh, team members uh, in the towers at that point in time. Unfortunately, for the people that worked for me, uh, they were all able to get out safely, but very vivid memories uh, of that. Uh, I look back to uh, 2008, 2009, uh, global financial crisis, which was uh, very impactful, uh, significant regulatory changes in our business occurred, very rough uh, time period. Uh, but it also led to uh, the, the bull market in 2009 that we're still really in today. Um, and I certainly think about uh, this past year uh, with the global pandemic, uh, you know, celebrating that anniversary of this, um, this uh, life-changing experience that we've been through uh, over the last 12 months and certainly um, how it's all impacted you and your, your college experience. But uh, in the end, I think we will all uh, learn from this experience and we will certainly uh, all come out um, far better uh, in the end. So again, as I mentioned, uh, I graduated in 1999 and, and prior to my graduation, I did spend some time as an intern. I'd always had a, uh, an affinity for the financial services businesses uh, way back and I knew I wanted to be more on the sales side of the business. And that's why I went after um, a cold calling experience with the brokerage firm. Certainly things are very different today. That's not a way that, uh, it's not a very effective uh, way to, uh, to gain clients nowadays. But I did have an opportunity based on that experience uh, when I graduated to uh, work for a firm which is now part of Ameriprise. Uh, and I started off as a financial advisor uh, back then, uh, the, the company did uh, give us the ability to get all of our licenses. They had a very modest training program, which led to a, a very uh, great experience as a financial advisor, uh, client facing. And that's what I thought I would do for my entire career, be a financial advisor. Uh, little did I know that uh, things would change. Uh, I had individuals approach me regarding uh, leadership opportunities within the company. Um, so I decided to take that path, uh, and that's the path that I've been on uh, ever since. And it's been a very good path for me. Um, the grass isn't always greener. Being a financial advisor is cer certainly something that uh, I still uh, miss, uh, but I still have the opportunity to work along with uh, clients in some degree, shape, or form. Uh, spent 10 years with that company. Uh, the company at that, uh, after my 10 years was uh, sold. Uh, to again, a company which is now part of uh, Ameriprise. And from there, I decided to not stay with the company, but pursue another path. And that was actually to go to work for Morgan Stanley. And I spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, at Morgan Stanley in the more traditional wealth management and full service uh, channel of the business. Uh, I was in a, a variety of different leadership roles with Morgan Stanley. 
uh, primarily in Arizona. I was I spent a little bit of time in Cleveland and eventually uh, migrated uh, back to Michigan. So I did move throughout my career uh, to a variety of different opportunities. So um, as a piece of career advice as I move through uh, this presentation is don't be afraid to take chances. Don't be afraid uh, to move, uh, certainly. Uh, and, and certainly do it for the right reasons because it oftentimes will uh, get you out of your comfort zone and can lead to some bigger opportunities for you down the road. Um, really enjoyed my time at Morgan Stanley, had an opportunity to work uh, with, with and for a number of very interesting individuals, uh, a variety of different uh, financial advisors, a variety of different um, people within the wealth management business from uh, the very top of the line, uh, private wealth management team uh, all the way down to more traditional retail uh, wealth management uh, uh, based uh, advisors. And one of the things about Morgan Stanley that really stands out to me is how much they have changed their business model. From when I st started with that organization in 2000 to where they are today, a lot of it is credited to uh, James Gorman who runs the institution right now where we really uh, put an emphasis on client facing business and really the retail brokerage model. Uh, Morgan Stanley was primarily a institutional trading based firm. Nowadays, the wealth management unit, the, the retail brokerage unit uh, is the unit that makes the most money for the company. Um, so again, great experience uh, while I was there, but things started to change uh, within the industry uh, late in my tenure at Morgan Stanley. And I say that because there was an evolution between traditional wealth management shops like Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch. They started looking a lot more like banks. They started, they started adding more banking and lending solutions so they could take market share away from banks. Interestingly enough, banks were doing the same thing. The banks were adding more wealth management products and services so they can take money away from the traditional wealth management shop. So essentially it was a levelizing of the playing field and both of those institutions, uh, the banks and the wealth management shops started to look more like each other. So I noticed that uh, within my career and I made a decision to uh, uh, change and I decided to enter the banking wealth management side of the business in 2012. Um, why did I do that? I thought I could really make a difference. I really thought I could utilize the experience that I had the traditional wealth management side of the business and bring that over to um, really an institution that could uh, grow at a much quicker pace than what I was seeing in the Morgan Stanley's of the world. Again, um, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, very, very strong uh, institutions, very well-run institutions. Uh, they still, they do incredibly well in the business. Uh, but I, I felt that from an opportunity standpoint, that the banks were going to pick up a lot of momentum and, and really capture more market share. And that's exactly what they, they have done since that uh, 2012 time period for me. So I started in a, a regional sales management uh, role um, with a, a bank here that you may be familiar with, Fifth Third Bank. Uh, held a, a variety of different uh, roles within that organization uh, throughout a, a number of years. That gave me an opportunity to work for another bank, uh, Citizens Bank, which is based out east, uh, for their wealth management team and took on a much larger role as, a, as the Midwest Divisional Sales Manager. I oversaw the business in the uh, state of Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, everything uh, really west of uh, Philadelphia. Um, that was a, a very fun role for me. It, again, it allowed me to get out of my comfort zone. It allowed me to uh, lead a much larger team. Uh, it allowed me to get uh, a lot closer to the top of the house with regards to um, the business, the planning of the business, the decisions around the business. Um, so it, it, it really gave me an opportunity to get involved in a number of different projects that I wouldn't have had I stayed at uh, my previous institution. A few years later, uh, Chemical Bank, TCF Bank uh, came knocking uh, at my door and, and gave me an opportunity to, to run the investment program. And that's what I've done here for the last couple of years. Uh, I inherited a legacy program at Chemical Bank, which was mainly just based in Michigan. Uh, we've merged both of those banks together over the course of the last year. Uh, and now we're expanding our wealth management services across uh, both the legacy chemical bank footprint as well as the uh, legacy TCF uh, bank footprint. So really giving me an opportunity to 
improve a, a team at Chemical Bank and build one out across the TCF uh, bank footprint. Uh, December of this year, we uh, received the, the announcement that uh, TCF would be merging into uh, Huntington, uh, which we are I am very deeply involved in the integration process right now between the two businesses. Uh, they are very similar. Uh, Huntington's very excited to uh, have TCF uh, join the organization uh, based on the expansion uh, plans and uh, the footprint that we have uh, out west. And when I say out west, that really means that uh, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Colorado uh, market for us. So it, uh, it is a very nice uh, acquisition, uh, certainly for Huntington. It's a very nice move uh, for, for TCF. And we're certainly excited about uh, what that's going to look like here as we move uh, throughout this year and into uh, 2022. Um, so again, you know, why, you know, why me? Uh, what do I like to do? What am I uh, known for based on all this background that I've just given you? It really, I think my legacy in the business and, and why these institutions have brought me uh, on board is, you know, truly I strive to build high performing team. I am a very uh, results driven individual. Um, and it's not just all about results, but at the end of the day, that's really how we are all measured. Uh, so for me, uh, there's a number of elements that go into, well, how do you build uh, high performing teams? Uh, well, certainly I, I start at the top and I, I think my strongest point is the recruiting aspect of this. Uh, I have a very expansive network for, for me. I've worked across the United States. I've worked for a number of different institutions. Uh, so I've met a lot of people along the way, and I've also had the ability to network with a number of uh, people along the way. So I'm somewhat of a known uh, commodity uh, within our business. I just happened to, to be here in uh, Michigan right now, which uh, I certainly grew up and uh, call it home. Uh, but uh, traveling and uh, getting out of my comfort uh, zone has allowed me to really expand that uh, network. Um, why me? How else can you build uh, high-performing teams? Um, you know, certainly the coaching and the development. Uh, had I not gone into this business, I probably would have gone into teaching. My mother was a teacher. I've always had that in my blood. And that's certainly what, uh, what we do here. And, uh, and I truly spend a lot of time with my team. Uh, I don't develop financial advisors as closely today. Uh, I, I have sales leaders who work for me that are doing this, but we work very closely with our team members to really help them uh, build a business. So something that uh, you're all very familiar with today, still being at, at some, wherever you are within your college experience, you're very uh, attuned to that uh, coaching and the development and the teaching uh, side of what we do. Um, working in the bank channel, uh, another element that's very important to me, my brand, and what I do well is that partnership and collaboration. Uh, and that's really ultimately what drove me to the banking channel. But that resonates throughout business today. You really need to uh, build that skill set, uh, make sure that you are a very good team member, a team oriented player, and somebody that is you know willing to be part of a team. So here at TCF, that that is very important to us from a culture standpoint. But I don't really know any organization that uh, is not about. Uh, that partnership and collaboration and, and teamwork, which leads me really to, you know, a couple of my last points, you know, culture. Culture is very important in every institution. Uh, we, we do feel very strongly about that here. I feel very strongly about it. I really strive to build a, a culture on our team of trust, uh, a culture that is uh, innovative uh, by nature, um, a culture that uh, is in, um, uh, empowerment is, is probably the best way that I can put it. Uh, really allowing my team members to provide uh, me with the feedback that I need to help them become the best that they can be uh, within their career. What can we do to make a, a better investment business? What can we do to make a better client experience? That, so that empowerment goes a long way uh, with, with me and with my team, which really allows us to win as a team. And that's what we do. It's not about me. It's not about my leaders. It's really about uh, all of us together uh, as a team. And then lastly, and most importantly for, for me, and especially during this time period is I welcome and, and I embrace change. Change is constant. Uh, I gave you some uh, things that have happened through the past 30 years of my career that really stood out. Lots of change there. Um, 
who knows what uh, change we have over the course of the next year. I don't think anybody expected a global pandemic to hit in 2020. Um, for me, for my team, uh, this past year, we had a record year. We, I think uh, as a, from a bank perspective, I think we led the entire bank from a performance standpoint. We stood out. Um, we led our, our peer groups uh, for our broker dealer. Why? We embraced change. We, we made some, uh, some tweaks to our business model. We embraced technology. Um, we adapted and the team did incredibly well in a very, very challenging uh, environment last year. So uh, any words of advice uh, that I would give you would be definitely embrace change because, you know, change is inevitable. So moving along, and, and I, again, uh, Elizabeth, if you could put the slide up uh, for the group, I'd like to talk a little bit about TCF Wealth Management. Um, now, granted, this uh, will be changing here in the future as we become part of uh, Huntington Financial Advisors and Huntington Bank. So if you look over to the left, you'll see investment services and wealth direct. These are two uh, pieces of the overall wealth management business that I oversee. Uh, the investment services business is our branch based financial advisor team. So my team are field based financial advisors that work in the banking center along with our retail team members. In addition to our team, we also have a couple of business partners uh, that tag along, and that would be our business bankers, as well as our mortgage loan officers. So essentially our retail employees, our financial advisors, our lending officers, and our business banking officers all work very collaboratively to really help uh, the clients meet all of their financial services need. My average uh, advisor covers anywhere from uh, three to five uh, banking centers, and they, they are truly integrated within the team. They are uh, truly as uh, part of the team. Um, advice and planning, that's what we do. And I, I saw uh, on your slide presentation that you're working in conjunction with the Financial Planning Association of Michigan. Uh, kudos to you. That's exactly what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, serving the needs of our clients and really solving uh, for a number of the financial challenges that, that they may have throughout their life. Uh, we, we provide all the same solutions that all of our competitors uh, provide, whether you're working at Charles Schwab or Fidelity or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, we all essentially do the same thing. We all have the same product services and, and solutions uh, across the board. And again, uh, more so than anything else, uh, we work in a very collaborative environment uh, with a number of our line of business partners. Uh, moving over to Wealth Direct, what is this? This is my centralized financial advisor team. And I have two teams. One is based in Grand Rapids. Uh, the other team is based in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And essentially, they do the same thing as our branch-based financial advisors, but they are just not in the branches. Uh, this team essentially covers a very uh, 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 specialized subset uh, of our client base, as well as all of our uh, branches, our banking centers that are not covered by a branch based financial advisor. So what would that be? The majority of the legacy TCF footprint on the Western uh, side for us. So that uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, and the Colorado footprint is primarily where our, our Wealth Direct uh, team covers right now. So again, they, uh, if you think about uh, comparison, you would think about Charles Schwab and Fidelity, mainly a centralized uh, business unit. Uh, as you move over, you'll see private banking. So private banking is a more of a team-led approach. Uh, the, the, the advisors that uh, work in, in private banking uh, primarily are covering more affluent clients than my team covers. My team is, is what we would call the mass affluent marketplace. So everything from a million dollars in investment, investable assets down really falls into my space. Private banking really encompasses everything above that, but primarily $3 million and above in investable assets. Uh, they handle client needs uh, on the banking side, on the lending side of the business, uh, as well as the investment side of the business. Think complexities, think of challenges, think of business owners uh, and the needs uh, going into more affluent clients and how that particular team uh, best helps uh, that subset of groups. So a little higher touch, a few more people, uh, hence the, the uh, higher uh, net worth 
uh, associated with this. And then lastly, uh, to the far right, you'll see retirement plan services. Again, the institutional, uh, the retirement planning side of the business, very uh, integrated with our uh, business banking clientele, uh, some more of the institutions that uh, we happen to do business with. Uh, it's a part of our business that um, you know, we outsource, uh, but we help uh, solve needs for our clients. So we don't do a lot of it in-house. We use some third-party vendors to help administrate uh, our planned business for us. But uh, it's a very good entree into a number of client relationships. And that's why we do have it as an offering within our entire wealth management team. So this team is very similar to how it looks at Huntington Bank. Uh, some differences would be my report line uh, today for the investment services and the wealth direct business reports in through what we call the consumer bank. And in the consumer bank umbrella, you have our retail partners, you have our mortgage banking partners, um, you have our business banking uh, partners as well. Uh, so all of those businesses really fall in the consumer bank. Private banking uh, at Huntington is its own separate business model and has a different report line. So some of the little differences between TCF and, uh, and Huntington Bank. All right, I know I've been talking a lot, so we're getting close to, uh, to Q&A, so we'll get there. Um, career paths. Uh, essentially, there are, there are two primary career paths uh, in the wealth management uh, business uh, you know, as you are uh, thinking about what you want to do uh, in, as you're really approaching graduation. One we'll call the buy side, one we'll call the sell side of the business. Uh, the best way that I can break that down would be this way. The buy side of the business is a little bit more on the, of the analytical side of the business, uh, portfolio managers, uh, financial analysts corporate finance, uh, mergers and acquisition, venture capital. Generally, these uh, require advanced schooling, uh, oftentimes MBAs, um, advanced designations such as uh, CFPs, uh, CPAs are certainly preferred for this path. So if you are an analytical person by nature, um, this is a, a very good path for you. Uh, and don't be discouraged, it's a very challenging career path, a um, little harder to get into than the sell side of the business, uh, but there are certainly opportunities uh, on the buy side of the business and on the analytical side of the business. Um, and, and they're out there. You just have to work a little bit harder to find uh, some of those opportunities. Um, so I'm sure as you've gone through career services, I'm sure as you've had conversations with your professors, uh, they have uh, had conversations with you uh, about uh, uh, this particular path and, and, and potentially and hopefully how to get to those levels. Uh, sell side, uh, again, uh, relating to selling and don't be afraid of that term selling. It's not a scary term and it's not a derogatory term uh, because uh, primarily most people are in some sort of a selling capacity. I'll call it more client facing capacity. And that's really the side of what a financial advisor uh, does. Um, and there's a number of different options uh, for the sell side of the business. Uh, some of it is a little bit of an overlap on the buy side, like portfolio managers could also be on the sell side uh, because they may spend a little bit more time client facing. But essentially, you have uh, one, the online channel, and that would be your Fidelities, your Schwabs of the world, um, and so forth. Very, um, very high level technology, uh, very um, forward thinking uh, client experience. Uh, Robo would be uh, one of those um, options as well from an online side, but all providing financial advice and guidance to the people that they do business with. Uh, it is also client facing and a lot of it also is uh, based on uh, programs that you would use to, to help yourself invest. Uh, secondly, um, the Wirehouse channel, the Morgan, uh, the Morgan Stanleys and the Merrill Lynch's of the world, and I've spent some time in that world, uh, very traditional wealth management shops. Um, what is your career path there? A, a number of these banks uh, still do have uh, viable uh, training options, not as robust as what I started in the business, uh, not as built out as it used to be, it, but there's still a viable option to get into training programs uh, with a number of these institutions. Oftentimes you may join, uh, they will sponsor all of your licensing. They will put you through a rigorous training. You may be part of a, a team. You may be a junior partner on a team but certainly all viable options in terms of uh, getting you uh, started within the financial services business. 
uh, you will also have the channel, which is called uh, RIA, Registered Investment Advisors, or more the independent uh, advisor side of the business. Uh, another viable option. Oftentimes, uh, your career path uh, for these institutions may start off more of a, on the client service side of the business, uh, which then would allow you to uh, become a financial advisor uh, or some sort of a, a wealth management oriented advisor with these firms. But again, a different path, something that has become uh, much more popular over the last uh, 10 years, particularly the uh, I, uh, RIA uh, channel, uh, because it doesn't require as many licenses uh, as the traditional wealth management shops. And the oversight is uh, far different, a little bit less stringent than the oversight that we have on our business. And then lastly, uh, the channel that I'm in today on the bank side of the business through with TCF and soon to be uh, Huntington, JP Morgan Chase, all the major banks uh, for the most part have an investment services and a private banking uh, division that provides that uh, investment advice in a very segmented manner based on uh, the client's net worth and the client's uh, investable assets. Um, here, the, the career path Path, uh, the career path at Huntington will be really through the retail banking type channel. And I think that there's um, there are certainly reasons why uh, you would want to go down that career path. Uh, you will start uh, more in a retail banking oriented capacity uh, as a banker. Uh, you then become a licensed banker. So you would acquire some security licenses uh, and then you would be recommending investment solutions to a number of your clients in addition to some banking products and services. So it's a very well-rounded uh, background. And from there, your next uh, step would be into the path of a financial advisor and actually taking over a number of different uh, banking centers and really integrating yourself within that retail uh, team and providing investment advice uh, to clients that, that need that help and, and truly want that help. So it's a very good uh, path. Another reason why I think it's a good path uh, as well is because it's going to give you a few more options, meaning if you get into a retail banking environment, you decide uh, that you find uh, your interest is uh, waning on investments, but you have a greater interest on the business banking side of the business, you can always pivot and, and take that particular path. Or maybe you decide that uh, I'd really like to stay in retail banking and become a, uh, a branch manager or banking center manager or prefer uh, uh, really to go after that uh, management track on that side of the business, you can do that. So again, the banking side may provide a few more career options for you um, if you decide to move away from the investment side of the business. So uh, with that being said, I know I've uh, provided you a lot of information uh, regarding uh, you know, my background, providing some information on TCF, uh, wealth management and uh, career pathing side of it. I'd like to provide a little advice if, if I may to you because it uh, not too long ago I was in a, a very similar seat to you and there are some things that uh, that I certainly uh, would have done differently. Um, as a uh, recruiter, uh, I spend a lot of time with a variety of different candidates, some people with limited experience, uh, some people with a bunch of experience. Um, and there are, there are some things that I've encountered along the way that uh, maybe have helped to you as you uh, continue uh, your uh, collegiate career and you move on to your uh, professional career. So, you know, number one on the list is if you can get experience, get experience. And I know Garrett mentioned that we do have an intern program, very competitive. Uh, I don't think we hire as many interns today as we once did, um, but we do have an intern type of a program. Many companies do uh, seek them out. Uh, work for free if you have to, work part-time, whatever you can do, get, try to find experience in the business. It will help you out. More so than anything else, it will give you a preview of things to come. And, you know, fortunately, you're all young. It's okay if you go into something, you don't like it, you can make a change and that, that is okay. That is not a problem, but get that experience so then you can determine, you know, truly what you really want to do in the long term. Uh, get sales experience, whatever that may be. Working in a retail capacity uh, is, is sales experience. Uh, oftentimes uh, working in uh, the bar and the restaurant, the hospitality business is some form of sales experience. Uh, don't be afraid to get out there and get in front of people and uh, provide some advice and some guidance to them. Uh, it will truly help you throughout your career. Uh, I don't know what the statistic is today, but I know a number of uh, years ago, there was a statistic that high percentage of individuals that run major corporations 
uh, Fortune 500 CEOs have come out of a, a selling background in some way, shape, or form. So get sales experience. Um, if you truly love this business, follow the financial markets. Watch CNBC, get on Yahoo Finance, read Barron's Magazine, subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, whatever you need to do but truly follow the financial markets. Uh, and again, I, I applaud uh, all of you who put together the presentation to, to start and uh, some of the information that you provided um, on where we are with the COVID uh, relief package, what happened uh, you know, certainly in uh, Texas, all of that is very important uh, and you're following the news. So I applaud you. And I assume that all of you are doing that to some way, shape or form. What are the markets doing? Uh, you know, what, are, what is the bond market doing? What's happening with the economy right now? How are uh, changes in the White House affecting or could affect uh, where our business goes right now? So follow it, uh, have an interest. If you truly have an interest and you have a passion for it, everything should fall in line uh, for you. Uh, when you go into your interviews, um, please don't take an interview to practice. And I know Michigan State University tells you to do that, don't because you're wasting my time. And as an interviewer and other people, uh, and I don't interview on campus any longer. I did uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, it becomes very obvious that you're, that you're practicing. Employers will pull themselves off of, uh, of that. But more importantly, you're, you're taking that slot away from somebody that truly may be interested. But go into your interviews over-prepared. Really go out of the way to make sure that you know who you're speaking to, to you know, um, as much about the company as you possibly can. That is one thing that definitely stands out uh, to somebody that you're sitting across the table. So definitely go in, research it, understand the role and make sure you have a whole bunch of questions. That truly stands out for candidates. Um, small stuff matters. It really does. So when they say dress for success, dress for success, look sharp. I understand you're a college student and I was a college student and I, at one point in time, and I certainly didn't have a lot of money as I was uh, finishing up my senior year, but do whatever you can to really look sharp as you go into that interview. That's your first impression and first impressions make a difference. Um, in addition to it, a small thing that today, interestingly enough, doesn't happen very often, follow up with a thank you. And I don't expect my uh, candidates to send me a, a letter uh, today, but an email just thanking me for my time is important. Don't blow that off. That, that, that definitely goes a long way. As a recruiter, I send thank yous to the people that I've interviewed that are looking for a job and working for me. So I still do that. Uh, I, I think that that's important. Maybe I'm old school. Um, but I, I do know that it's something that uh, tends to stand out. And then, uh, you know, really lastly, you know, how do you leave a, an impression, you know, during that interview on the small stuff standpoint? Um, I picked this up from Jim Cramer. Now, Jim Cramer is very well known uh, as a, a, a CNBC contributor. He has time uh, for fast money. If anybody watches, you know, CNBC at seven o'clock at night, and I don't uh, very often, but he wrote an article about 30 years ago and he talked about interviewing and he talked about candidates that would come to see him. In, in, in this article, he said, bring me something. You're taking my time, bring me something. Bring me a bagel, bring me a coffee, bring me a donut, bring me a pencil with your school's name on it. Bring me something. That is the little thing that will stand out. And I have a story around it. The little things and the small things matter. While I was at Morgan Stanley, there was a story that resonated with me. You had a very large client opportunity, a billion dollar client uh, that had two investment firms, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. Essentially, they do the same thing. They are the, the premium brands out in the marketplace for ultra high net worth clients. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, both firms made their presentations. Uh, essentially, they looked very, very similar. Um, and the client uh, was left to deciding who should they do business with. The client chose Morgan Stanley. And as the story goes, the client chose Morgan Stanley because Morgan Stanley sent a thank you to the wife. And the thank you was a piggy bank. The couple had a brand new child and they noticed that in the child's room, 
They didn't have a piggy bank. That won the business. So the small things matter in the end. Even when you're talking about billion dollar people and a $5 piggy bank. There you go. So use it, use it to your advantage. Steal that story, talk to others about it, whatever you wanna do. And then lastly, listen and learn. Uh, I've been doing this a long time, but I certainly am not the smartest man in the business by any means. If you talk to my kids and my wife, uh, they would certainly confirm that fact. But one thing that I, that I have worked really hard on over the years is listening. I, I really try to listen uh, far more than I speak. And that's not apparent right now because all I've been doing is speaking at you for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. But listen, spend much more time listening and listen to the people that have experience. I wish that I would have done more of that throughout my entire career because it does matter. And as I sit here today as an old fart in this business, I truly look back on some of the experiences and some of the lessons that were given to me that I shrugged off at the time. It's like, yeah, whatever. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, I know everything. I'm, I'm 22 years old. I got this thing figured out. Listen, listen and learn. I, I still, to this day, I listen to uh, so many people uh, that I come in contact with. And I, I, I spend more time listening to individuals like yourself uh, who are innovators, who are the future uh, of our business, because that is where uh, we're going to continue to take this business. And that's why this business is going to be so exciting in five years from now. And it'll look far, far different than it is today. So with that, um, I will uh, thank you again for allowing me this time. Uh, whatever you need from me, please uh, ask. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, send me a private message. I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. But uh, uh, whatever I can do to give back, uh, that's what I'm all about. So with that, uh, I, uh, Justin, I'll turn it over to you and open it up for any uh, Q&A and I'll do my best to, uh, to answer any questions that you have of me. Awesome, Jeff, that was amazing. Yeah, anybody, any questions, please just feel to jump in or raise your hand if you have any for Jeff. Yeah, Jeff, I have a really good question for you. What, um, what have you seen in the past like 10 or 20 years in terms of wealth management? Like, have you seen any shifts or anything like that? Anything that's changed? In the uh, past 10 or 20 years when it comes to clients or anything like that? Yeah. So again, uh, great question. Yes. A lot of change in the past 10 years. Uh, we as a company uh, continue to move more in a digital format, meaning providing uh, that online experience, providing a more simpler experience uh, to all of our clients. We do that on the investment side. We certainly do that on the banking side of the business. Um, so we will, that trend is, is very viable, but client facing clients needing advice will always be there as well so clients essentially want options they want to be able to look at their ipad they want to be able to pull the information off of their ipad but they want to be able to sit in front of a financial advisor and they certainly want to be able to walk through and they want to be taught they want to be coached they want it they want to learn from you the expert what they should be doing and confirming what they've already learned awesome thank you you're welcome. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? I'll throw, here's a question that I'll throw out for the, for the group that I, that I definitely see. Robo. Uh, I think Robo is very real. Essentially, it's a you know, computer-based program uh, for everybody out there. Uh, there's no really uh, distinguishing net worth uh, for any of the people that are doing business in a Robo type of a platform right now. Uh, essentially, you're filling out a, a financial planning, a questionnaire type tool, uh, which then gives you a formula from which to how to invest and truly diversifies your model. I, I do think that that will continue to pull in more investment dollars. Uh, certainly, I'm sure this, this team has followed uh, GameStop and uh, what is going on for the, the no fee um, channels that we have out, out there right now. Uh, that's great. I'm glad that uh, the investment business is a very is something that is viable and, and more people are involved in right now. And I do think uh, we have a, a lot of smart people in our world these days that know how to find investment advice and there are investing in a variety of different ways. Uh, so that complements certainly what we do from the advice channel as well. And, and I do think that's a very exciting uh, trend uh, that we have. Uh, margins continue to uh, compress, fees will continue to go down. That's all good for the individual investor. Um, so I, I do see all of those trends um, continuing as, as we go forward. But 
the investment public will always need somebody that is client facing that they can sit down with as well, especially as you move throughout your years. Uh, as you go from a college student uh, to a working professional of 10 years to, you know, really building a family and then preparing for retirement and then certainly distribution of your assets uh, while you're in retirement. Uh, all viable options and, you know, all trends that will continue. Other questions? Hey, Jeff, I have a, I have a question. Oh. Yep, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Um, so I have... Um, you. Okay. Awesome. So I like your background, by the way. Great, great skyline. Um, I, you mentioned like reading the wall street journal and Barron's. Um, do you have any books you can maybe recommend us college students um, maybe that have helped you? Yes. Um, so there's been a number of, uh, you know, books over the years and I, I apologize. They don't, I, I have my library in front of me. Uh, again, I'm, I'm working from home. I have worked from home. Uh, for the past year, and uh, all of my uh, books that I keep on my shelf are actually in my office in uh, Troy. Um, you know, so how to make money in, in stocks is certainly one of the classics uh, that I've read. Uh, I believe it's William O'Neill, uh, Investors Business Daily founder. Um, it, it's more technically related, but it talks about the analytical side uh, of stocks. Uh, I always, I always uh, uh, like that particular book. Um, Again, I'm, I'm a sell side type uh, of advisor. Uh, that's the business that I'm in. Uh, we're very client facing. Um, Prospecting Your Way to Sales Success is a book from a guy named Bill Good that is probably 40 years old. I still think that there's a lot to be said a, a, about that particular uh, book. So those are two that just kind of stand out to me that are very, very old books, uh, but very uh, good books. Um, you know, I, I will always, uh, you know, from just a non-investment standpoint, um, seven habits of highly effective people, classic, read it. I just read it again for the 10th time. Uh, I, I subscribe, I, I don't like to read personally. So I do a lot of executive book summary type reading. And that's another one that I uh, read here recently, just to kind of reinforce some of the, the, the positive things that, uh, that I should be doing. And then I can coach, use to coach my team with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I haven't even looked at the, the chat line. I should. All right. Hey, Jeff, I just wanted to, um, real quick, I always love when we have, we have professionals come in and they share kind of the non-industry related things that, that are important, like the soft skill stuff. So like the story that you shared about, about Morgan Stanley and the, um, in the piggy bank. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't wait to find some time. To, I can't wait till I have my client 10 years down the road and I'm like, send them a piggy bank. Let's get, let's get them in. Like those stories always, always, um, they always light a fire under me and uh, they're very inspirational because it, it reminds you that this is, this business isn't just, um, you know, following some numbers and, and knowing what the Roth IRA contribution limit is this year, you know, it's, it's, it's more than that. And it's, it's, a, it's a people's business. So I really appreciate you sharing that stuff. Um, you know, I really hope the, the group here today uh, took that stuff to heart. Yeah. Thanks, Oscar. I, again, that's just a story of many stories that I've picked up over the years. And uh, I really hope that you can incorporate that. And I hope you all can incorporate something like that uh, when you get out into the workforce and you begin your career, uh, whether it's in wealth management, uh, financial services, uh, or whatever other business that you're in. Again, essentially, um, we are we are in the relationship business. We are in the the, the people business. Uh, it is about relationships, and the small things do matter in the very end. So certainly, the big stuff's important, but the small things are are very important as well. Uh, so don't forget about that as as you continue to uh, maneuver through your career. Of course, thank you. Right. Uh, yes, uh, I actually have a question as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what factors drive a company to uh, merge with another or to like acquire another company? You know, very good question. Wow. Um, a number of factors that go in. Um, certainly uh, the business, uh, the merge of TCF and Chemical Bank uh, really it was very um, positive for both institutions and um, 
trending in the right direction. So why did Huntington, uh, which was roughly a $120 billion bank, decide to buy a, a $50 billion bank? Uh, it, it came down to a, a number of uh, reasons. Uh, TCF was in a very good position, moving in the right direction, uh, but from a, a capital uh, expenditure standpoint, is, and some of the uh, some of the shall we say business um, decisions that we were going to be making down the road uh, required a, a lot of capital. Uh, whereas Huntington further down the road with some of those capital. So again, merging into, uh, into Huntington uh, provided a, a significant uplift to, to TCF and really accelerated the growth of the TCF side of the business. Uh, secondarily, the markets that TCF was in. Uh, most of those markets uh, were not part of the legacy Huntington footprint. And where we were uh, we will be able to consolidate businesses and certainly save a lot of cost uh, in doing so and grab a lot more market share. Um, so economies of scale, uh, size matters, technology investment matters nowadays. Um, all of those factors really go into, you know, why a company would uh, merge uh, and or make acquisitions, especially in the banking business. I do expect that trend to continue. Uh, we've seen a few of them already here this year. Um, I expect larger banks to continue to acquire smaller banks. Um, there are certain size limits uh, where it, it may become a little bit prohibitive uh, due to reserves that banks need to have on hand. Uh, but essentially, uh, I do believe that uh, larger banks will continue to, uh, to purchase a viable, strong, growing smaller banks, as well as other businesses nowadays. Good, very good question. All right, thank you. I also had a question. All right. Um, what was the, like, was it mostly a positive response from the clients, um, you know, after the merger? Um, I mean, both of them happening now. Uh, the TCF clients uh, after the merger announcement? Yeah, just like after um, both the mergers, you know, what were the response from some of the clients and um, can you talk a little bit more about like maybe benefits that they would receive after the merger, bef like before and after? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, the response is very mixed across the board and, uh, you know, being transparent. Uh, and I say that because the first merger between Chemical and, and, and TCF Bank, um, Chemical Bank was a very um, regional based bank here in Michigan, and oftentimes in a rural footprint in Michigan. So uh, the uh, changing the name from chemical to TCF was a little bit hard on, on some of our retail oriented clients, but overall it was gonna be a pickup in experience and products and services and solutions that uh, they would be provided. So in the end, uh, positive. Uh, so similarly with uh, TCF now merging into Huntington, there are some clients that uh, maybe not are, are truly happy with the name change again, especially within such a very short period of time. If you were a chemical uh, customer or client that became TCF, that's now becoming Huntington. Uh, but in the end, providing more scale, providing uh, ultimately um, a better client experience due to products and services and solutions, still being able to deal with the same people that they've been dealing with for a number of years. Uh, will be a very positive experience for them in the end. Uh, so we're, we're still working through some of this right now. Uh, nobody likes change. Our clients don't like change. We don't like change, um, but change is inevitable. Uh, so I, I think once the initial shock uh, wears off, uh, oftentimes you can sort through some of the challenges and, and really start to see uh, the benefits of uh, the merger, the benefits of the change that's coming. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. You got it. Well, I think we're at the end of our time here this evening. So um, out of respect for all the, the homework I'm sure everyone has to do, I know we're around midterms week. <laughs> I think we should probably uh, end our session tonight. So thank you.